My name is Joseph Kendra, Curator of Public Programmes, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce this evening's discussion between Rem Kulhas and Wolfgang Tillmans on the occasion of his wonderful exhibition here, 2017. World-renowned architect, arch architectural theorist, and urbanist Rem Kulhas featured the work of Tillmans, now on display in the Tank Studio downstairs as part of his curated dissection of architecture in his Elements exhibition in the Venice Architecture Biennale of 2014. And tonight's event takes its name from just that work. Book for Architects is a two-channel video installation juxtaposing still images of buildings, cities, and rooms across two per perpendicular walls, from iconic skylines to back corridors, hotel lobbies to emergency housing. Over a period of 10 years, Tillman's photographed buildings in 37 countries on five continents to produce this work, showing architecture through the eyes of the artist. His interest and even passion for the complexity, irrationality, madness and beauty found in quotidian buildings, street patterns and fragments of spaces is reflected in Book for Architects and will no doubt be evidenced by tonight's discussion. I'm sure that both Rem and Wolfgang will also find common ground within the gap between the profession of architecture's rhetoric and the reality of the lived experience. A few quick thank yous before we start. Annette and Armin at Tillman Studio and Federico Martelli at OMA in a helping coordinate tonight. Chris Durkon, director of the Volksbühne in Berlin and former director of Tate Modern, who uh, has been instrumental in making this event happen. I'd also like to thank the exhibition curators and colleagues Helen Sainsbury, Emma Lewis, Finta Moran and Emily Stone, who have supported and delivered a rich and varied public programme across this exhibition, including talks and live performances from names including Wreck and Reference, Thomas Brinkman, Throwing Shade, Tim Knapp and Jay Pluck, Laura Snapes, Adam Buxton, Jeremy Della, Erica Skirty and Anna Minton. The talk will finish at eight, with time including for questions from you to the audience, and then Wolfgang will be available to sign catalogues on sale in the staff foyer just outside the cinema. Without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Rem Kulhas and Wolfgang Tillmans. Yeah, thank you, Joseph, for the introduction. <clears throat> um, this talk is um, kind of for myself. Um, I um, want to ask all the questions I've always wanted to ask an architect, and I've done that before with an astronomer at a Serpentine Gallery Park night, um, uh, uh, Dimitar Sasilov from Harvard Astrophysics Institute, and at the Hayward when they had this learning summer, I uh, invited a uh, optics professor to ask all about um, recording and seeing. Um, we first met uh, in 2000 for a portrait um, and then met again in 2005. Uh, Hans Ulrich Obwist was uh, interviewing me for Numero and came by my studio and uh, as a surprise interviewer guest uh, you came along and uh, 2007 we did another portrait and uh, um, and then 2014, I was a uh, um, guest in your international pavilion, the Elements of Architect, uh, the Elements of uh, uh, the Elements exhibition, mm -hmm. um, and um, and I uh, in the last room was um, able to show this work, uh, book for architects, which uh, Joseph uh, didn't mention, is on view on the turbine hall level um, in a separate room from my exhibition, and it's a free entry. So uh, um, about 90% of people who came to see my show have missed the um, installation um, on the ground floor, but come back any time before 11th of June. Um, so what um, I had written down the, the word book for architects um, about 15, 14 years ago for the first time, and, um, and it came back to me um, again and again and as an expression of my desire to be in dialogue with architects. Um, I find architecture is usually only discussed in the media and amongst people in general in relation to massive uh, signature buildings, uh, but almost never in how architectural details affect actual real lives of millions. How windows, for example, in some European countries have become so energy efficient that they completely lock out the outside world. For example, I always like the inefficiency of English windows as they allow a closer connection to the outside environment. 
and even its smell. Um, so there are a number of thoughts and ideas, and I just run through them. Um, um, I decided to have no images um, uh, in this talk, and uh, Rem agreed to go along with this, um, because um, I guess the nature of architecture presentations and talks is that they are so um, incredibly image and slide um, led. And um, maybe we just think about it today with images in our mind. And um, I um, observed that, so, so Book for Architects in particular is also a response to architecture photography um, because uh, it, uh, it is almost always showing an idealized version of a newly built reality or an idealized computer image of what doesn't even exist yet. Um, and both are a denial of reality, uh, which I think is very powerful and not much discussed. Um, and um, like, of course, one could say it's like all advertising, um, a photograph of a Big Mac um, is very different from what the Big Mac looks in uh, real life. And, um, and uh, in Book for Architects, I wanted to um, show photography how it feels like to me, um, what it looks like um, through my eyes uh, rather than through a straightened camera. Um, so maybe, um, yeah, worth asking the question, why do architects embrace these visual tools and always have visual tools? Is it the special awareness within your profession that it is all nothing but plans until it's actually built? All designs are nothing until they are realized. So therefore, the rendering and visuals uh, are there to make it look as much as possible like reality. And then even after completion, they are made to, the photographs are made to look like the plants and vice versa. Is this coming from um, that you have to um, convince people in competitions? Uh? I, uh, I really, um, uh, you know, I'm inclined to agree with you, uh, but on the other hand, I could also uh, maybe talk about the main, what I say is the main issue. I think it's maybe uh, you were suggesting that architects are always uh, in, interested in idealization uh, and, and as if that is a kind of neurosis. But I think it only becomes painful uh, if you have no ideals. Uh, there was a period that architecture had ideals and let's take the beginning of the century. I became an architect uh, when I saw in Russia in 1967 uh, a series of architectural renderings, architectural illustrations, uh, kind of productions, uh, that actually expressed an idea. And it was extremely satisfying and it <coughs> convinced me and seduced me to the point that I thought I wanted to do that too. And one of the m most compelling parts of it was that it suggested that you don't have to live like this, but you could live like that. Yeah, you don't have to live in a kind of single room in a kind of larger kind of building, but you could also work in a series of cabins that uh, replace Moscow uh, and that uh, are completely a mixture between uh, kind of city density and countryside. So I think what is painful kind of right now is that uh, we still have a certain habit or tradition of idealis idealization, but it's only in terms of the building itself and completely devoid or separated from any ideology or, or even intention. So I think that that is f painful for you uh, and for, to me and, and not the fact that idealization is per se, per se wrong. I, th I would even say it's a kind of key element of what architecture needs to do. To create. Yeah, and I would say, let's say there's a kind of series of uh, extremely beautiful uh, pictures by uh, a single photographer who worked the, uh, who did the work of Le Corbusier. It's always a fragment of the building itself. It's black and white. 
it's completely artificial. Um, sometimes you see a glimmer of a human being. So uh, all these things that we currently in, in our time find repulsive uh, in the 20s or 30s could be very plausible and part of an artistic project, if not a political project. So I think the, the, the issue is kind of really what do we have to say at this moment and how it is said and, and then typically the media that we used are the media of the market economy. Which answers the question <laughs> of you know? uh, why is architecture photography the way it is and maybe on to that is what is your assessment of today's architecture photography? Do you see any shifts from 30 years ago? Um, well, I think that uh, you're right, uh, and, and that is actually why I invited you to, um, um, to, to be part of the Venice Biennale. Uh, the issue, you used a relatively polite word, uh, signature architect. I'm very grateful that you didn't use the word star architect, uh, because um, this is, has been a curse uh, kind of around maybe since the kind of late 80s, uh, where the word alone kind of uh, kind of provoked an entire uh, class of architecture or a genre of architecture, where the uh, the issue to make uh, an exceptional and eccentric building became almost like an obligation. And I think to make that kind of work, of course, uh, photography had to become complicit, and 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 would you know simply focus on the building itself. And so what we have not uh, an architecture, uh, a photography that um, is eloquent about uh, an eloquent and, and legitimate project, that we have kind of photographs that uh, simply isolate the building, uh, take it away from the context and, and focus on it to uh, present uh, and pretend that there is uh, content. Mm. <clears throat> And, and uh, what I, the, the point of doing in Venice was actually, again, to escape from that uh, obligation, uh, which takes many forms, sometimes boring buildings or sometimes the, the whole point of Venice was to take away that attention and to work on fragments, including windows, including English windows. And that's why I asked you also to participate, to shift the uh, kind of architectural judgment from uh, a building in context rather than a building in itself. Mm. Um, maybe staying on the subject of presentation um, um, that I, I somehow wrote down charts in your talks, do charts work? Um, but this comes from like this sense that whenever I see architects speak um, or it being discussed that there is um, that there is somehow uh, an inevitability suggested in the development of the ideas mm. that it can only come to this outcome. Mm. Um, that is like this maximum convincing uh, proposition. Mm. And um, well, I have to really be careful for two things: uh, not not to uh, convey the depth of my self pity uh, and. Uh, uh, not to uh, uh, reveal the depth of my uh, own competitiveness uh, and um, uh, not to uh, show too much of my sense of superiority. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, so therefore, uh, I would like to d uh, kind of explain one thing about, thing about architecture uh, today, which is that uh, a vast majority of uh, jobs we get through competitions Competitions are a kind of form of torture that I don't know whether any uh, other profession has been willing to humiliate itself to uh, this extent, where somebody tells you, uh, I really respect you, I think you're an exceptional uh, human being, so can you uh, collaborate or participate with uh, 19 other uh, architects? that are similarly uh, amazing uh, uh, in, in a project where you have a 5% chance to uh, get the building. Uh, no other profession I mean, would take that. Excel? And so they... Uh, how can you excel? I mean, how can you get 
no, no, but, energy, uh, but, uh, but that energy. makes perhaps our compulsion to suggest that uh, our buildings are inevitable uh, uh, slightly, yeah. uh, no, exactly. slightly more yeah. understandable. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, it, it's funny because, of course, based on intuition, you can maybe kind of sometimes uh, get away with, with doubt or... or uh, saying I'm not sure, uh, and and maybe it might in certain circumstances work, uh, but uh, let's take take the competition for for the Tate, in which I could participate too. I'm sure that the uh, word doubt would have, or that any demonstrated doubts uh, would have been an immediate end of the effort. Mm. When I find <laughs> in, in, in art, in my work. Showing doubt or the possibility of doubt is essential for the work to um, succeed. Yeah, I know. And that's, so you're, I mean, you're kind of very lucky, but, but so of I course. Pity, I do pity yeah, you, no, honestly. No, no, but, uh, but of course we have doubts and we can also articulate them, but. but uh, no, I, I know that you have, or I hope yeah, you have, yeah, but, yeah, but you're yeah. not allowed to no, show no, but, them. Uh, it's, it's not. Uh, that you are not allowed to show them. I think we show them all the time, but uh, there may be a discrepancy first uh, between rhetoric and, and reality. Uh, and, and we, the more, I mean, we, we of course take the liberties to uh, project different personas and, uh, and, and all the other you know, discrepancies that the uh, artistic world uh, and now, uh, allows anyone to, to pursue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can show, pretend to be very, and do something very irrational. Um, something I find still um, a bit irrational is virtual reality. Um, like, um, no one seems to quite know what to do with it, but I was told that uh, um, besides porn, the future profit market is uh, selling real estate. That you can basically stand in Shanghai and put on VR glasses and, uh, and look at the uh, non-existing building in Vancouver that you're build buying an apartment in. And, and would that be wrong? I'm just yeah. asking because it is, it, is actually, uh, uh, it is actually replacing, potentially replacing architecture photography. I was speaking to a friend who is predominantly uh, uh, photographing architecture and, and he says like things are really changing and uh, there will be no need to make actual still photographs uh, when the whole thing can be scanned and uh, rendered. I, I think... I'm, I'm I'm kind of reluctant to, to, to go and predict you know, what will work or what will certain outcomes be. Uh, I, I, th I would say good luck to them and maybe they at some point uh, uh, come up with uh, really astonishing uh, conditions. I mean, I, I still remember uh, in 1989 when the wall had f uh, fallen, uh, I was doing a Kind of competition for a very big library in Paris, and that was the first time that you could work with uh, computer uh, and computer animation and computer renderings. And uh, I think that kind of through a mixture of naivety uh, and uh, need to explain a kind of radical pro uh, project and uh, helpers who were uh, quite open to um, pursue not so much uh, architecture precision but architecture concept that it became a very uh, suggestive tool and that it worked better to explain the complexity of the project than uh, any other way would have been so uh, I'm kind of reluctant to to really say that we're moving from authentic to inauthentic uh, 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 media or and that one inauthentic media could not eventually help the cause of architecture. Given that in the past technological advances so often have yeah, moved, and, moved and creativity and forward. Two, and two sides. Yeah. yeah. Um, I um, want to jump to one of my sort of nerdy or not particular questions. And in the book for architects, there isn't really any uh, judgment in the work except for uh, 
two or three consecutive slides which show um, um, lines of women outside uh, toilets um, and next to it a men's room toilet uh, uh, doors where there's no line. And I, it has um, really annoyed me um, for 15 years or so since I first observed it at Versailles Castle uh, and then at every, ever since I observe it in theatres everywhere. Women are made to wait and men can just pee and uh, that comes because uh, that's because um, the two toilets for men and women are built on the same footprint but are not taking into consideration that the process takes different amount of time and I just wonder like how is it possible in this intelligent world of architecture that no one has <laughs> ever addressed that? Uh, well, um, I, I'm not sure I'm the kind of right person to, uh, to uh, and, and particularly not in the name of the world of architecture uh, because uh, and, and, and that was actually as you can remember uh, one of the most amazing rooms in the elements of architecture where we spoke about or showed the development of kind of really banal uh, elements of architecture like floor, window, uh, ceiling, uh, etc. and where we had an entire s section dedicated to toilets. And um, I think that the, what we were showing was kind of in, in effect uh, a great uh, technological advance uh, with uh, a, a relatively kind of stable essence and slight aesthetic permutations uh, and with at the last moment a kind of technological uh, addition where sensors became part of the story and therefore the act of using a toilet became kind of more uh, a test or a connection to uh, the internet that could be kind of coupled, you know, it was in certain case coupled to to, um, to the directly to the hospital, uh, so that each event would be analyzed uh, in, in practically real time, uh, and and so therefore um, I would. Sorry, I'm really annoying, but I would say it's maybe more a question than to have more toilets for women than, than for men. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a cost issue, I guess, and, uh, but it should be sort of uh, like in a theatre or in, in venues where you assume a balanced uh, uh, gender audience. Uh, why? There used to be a kind of wonderful uh, architecture thinker who was uh, strictly not thinking, but proscribing how things were done or needed to be done. His name was Neufert. It was German, it was very kind of systematic. Uh, he continued to work through the Nazi period, but after the Nazis, he kind of was kind of reborn as a uh, proscribing how uh, contemporary architecture should be done. And there's certainly a correct proportion uh, men and women in that uh, in his catalog. It was. Uh... And I don't remember the formula, frankly, but. <laughs> uh, yes. So it hasn't really been addressed, and you don't know any example of a stadium or theater or. So, so let's uh, l let's uh, let's talk about it because you, because you raise it. I myself uh, can have only a tolerance for groupings of toilets, uh, um, for groupings of toilets, individual toilets below a certain scale. I think at certain moments, kind of five is maybe four. Maybe four would be my favorite. Anything beyond that, five, six, seven, eight, becomes, for my feeling, obscene. So then, uh, <laughs> then like so, uh, yeah. So uh, and there is no way of kind of inventing something new for it or uh, to impose a, a, a different atmosphere. Uh, so I would say have more of group, smaller groups. Uh, then uh, uh, think of larger or greater quantities. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's aesthetics against uh, waiting time. It's nothing to do with aesthetics, but uh, just some kind of instinct uh, to what, what scales uh, different aspects of human life deserve. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, no, that um, in an interview in 2002, you said the nice quote, um, 
the total lack of glamour is the attraction of Rotterdam. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I think that what uh, uh, I've recently be begun to kind of make a connection uh, that I didn't make before. Um, Rotterdam was uh, completely destroyed and therefore um, it had the advantage, uh, certainly for architects, uh, that it had to be completely rebuilt. Uh, some of that was done with uh, kind of incredible ingenuity, some of it was done with kind of almost, I would say, genius. Uh, there was from the very beginning uh, a kind of mood or a consensus on a kind of relatively, relatively um, modest uh, expression. Uh, there was some commitment to, to equality, uh, all very good things. But no one had a good word to say for it, you know, ever. And I, if, if I look now at the kind of general uh, disregard or lack of respect that is shown to uh, kind of cities like Dubai, I suddenly began to understand that kind of at some point in the very beginning, uh, Rotterdam was a kind of Dubai in Europe. You know? and, and that it therefore kind of suffered the same uh, incapacity of the educated public to be enthusiastic about things that are new or uh, to combine newness to the notion of a city. We all have a kind of imprint that cities can only be kind of grown over time and that anything that is happening out, out of nowhere is considered uh, simply inferior. And sort of ideas behind cities like Rotterdam or a lot of European cities had, um, well, they had an ideal behind it and of course the ideal behind Dubai uh, and cities like that, and here I am maybe misjudging, but it is like only profit driven. Right, so let's talk about that uh, later. later. Uh, uh, I, I, but I can say that uh, the, when a European uses the word only, he typically misunder, uh, underestimates uh, the condition that he typifies as only. But anyway, that's... Yeah, no, no, but, but I mean, that's, that makes you, of course, such an interesting person because you really have an in-depth uh, uh, knowledge and experience over decades um, across the continents. Um, you know, well, well, I... Well, yeah, so, so uh, the, let's talk, finish about Rotterdam. So it was kind of very plausible. But it benefited from not being popular uh, and from some of its intentions to even go out of fashion. Because social democracy kind of right now is not in a kind of very uh, kind of sparkling uh, conditions, let's say. And, and, and so, uh, but in the meantime, something kind of really weird has happened that Rotterdam has become popular and, and cool. And is now on the kind of typically around the 11th place of uh, places to visit uh, in the world. Um, and therefore you can see that the well-intentioned uh, has been kind of absorbed in, in a kind of generic uh, uh, typical urban pattern. But if I now look at uh, Dubai, kind of perhaps 15 years after first coming there, I see that uh, it's not only dedicated to fashion, but there is already a kind of process of transformation going on where industrial complexes are turned uh, not necessarily only in art galleries, but also in a kind of really interesting culture that is partly kind of magazine making, partly car repair, car, partly discrete elements of art, uh, art institutions, uh, but also other institutions, uh, educational institutions. There is you know, and, and, and this is after kind of maybe 20 years of its initial thing, really a um, layering uh, emerging there. Mm. And so we, we typically are extremely impatient in judging architecture, uh, even though we know ourselves that it takes uh, 400 years uh, for a real city to, uh, to grow. Mm. Um, last night I used this corkscrew. Um, like one of the super cheap um, ones um, and I um, didn't have any other at, in the house and really wanted to open this bottle of wine and I was uh, sort of hoping 
that it would not break, um, as these corkscrews usually have a tendency to do on their very first use. Um, you know, these particularly cheap ones. And, um, and I just wonder, like, what is this disingenuity in the world to sell shit that doesn't last? And, um, and same with buildings. Um, it's sort of really against people. Um, and um, I find this gap that is created when goods and buildings and services don't deliver what has been promised, that gap is called disappointment and creates unhappiness and, is, and uh, disengagement from society, really. Um, you know that, um, and again, like, I don't hold you hostage here for the um, whole practice of architecture, no? really. Um, but this, um, um, but in, in buildings, of course, in particular also, the use of materials is then reflecting onto the daily life of people so much. But, what is this condition? Well, uh, of course, it's the kind of market economy, you could say, and and the market economy has uh, kind of basically uh, maintained a consistent downward pressure of uh, what. So, so that would be the obvious answer. Um, on the other hand, we live in a, a kind of world with extremely unstable. Uh, um, cocktail of different needs and different activities um, and I would say that because of that instability it becomes harder and harder to actually at any given moment to capture uh, needs that we kind of think will not change over time. You do a library, but you know that kind of large parts of the kind of book department will eventually be changed by something else. You do a theater and you to find that after 25 uh, years uh, people kind of prefer it because it doesn't, to, to destroy it because it doesn't have uh, enough uh, glamour for the current moment or uh, enough uh, emanation of luxury for the current moment. So it's, you could say, okay, it's, it's, it's bad, but you could also say, well, maybe we live in a period where not every building deserves eternal life, uh, where not every need uh, deserves to be expressed in, in a kind of highly sophisticated manner. Maybe there are also uh, things that deserve temporarity, or maybe our cities are changing in, in kind of complexes that are not necessarily getting bigger and bigger, but uh, where also uh, other sections could could simply have uh, impermanence built in into them. I've been kind of really obsessed with, with the idea that, f first of all, what the potential of uh, preservation is, but also what the potential of elimination and erasure would be. If you kind of really found, and as part of the architectural repertoire, uh, the, that the act of erasure could be viable in Europe, uh, then you would perhaps be grateful for all those inferior uh, uh, materials because they almost kind of dictate their own kind of metabolism. Mm. And, and so I think in all these cases, in all these situations, there's more, more ambiguity. And I mean, sustainability is a big word in architecture, and I guess you can't build or do anything without using that word and claiming it, uh, or, or, or I guess also doing something about it. But I often wonder: um, is is a building that has like a thirty-year lifespan planned, thirty-year lifespan, can that ever be uh, called sustainable? Like in terms of material, you know, like um, I heard that like building is the single biggest CO2 producer. Um, I, uh, and and, and oh. if, if another profession was sitting here, they, they, they would probably be accused uh, with, with the same question. No. Uh, 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, I'm sure. Anyway, I'm sure. But let's, let's talk about it. Um, sustainability was actually always an issue in architecture uh, in, in I think that uh, Vitruvius with the Romans uh, was extremely intelligent in terms of kind of exploiting shadow kind of planning kind of things in an intelligent way uh, having materials that um, uh, came 
almost were part of nature and, and were used. Uh, but I think today it can also be done. Uh, for instance, uh, if you take Jean Pouvet, uh, he made uh, a number of kind of very uh, metallic sets that were prefabricated and that basically if it outlived its uh, plausibility in a given place, you could simply um, dismantle it and re-erect it uh, somewhere else. And, and I think I, I cannot uh, imagine a kind of more simple and more uh, compelling way of thinking about... Uh, and, and in principle, you can do that with every building in steel. And uh, more and more uh, with engineers, we, we develop a kind of logic where, you know, if a building is uh, no longer viable, you can kind of dismantle it and rebuild it in... in in on, uh, a different uh, configuration. So it's already built in the potential how to yeah, so unscrew it. built in, yeah. And, and, and so therefore there is you know, a lot more uh, actual progress in, in these uh, things than, than you would typically think. And that doesn't mean, and that is maybe my handicap, that I try to always like a kind of indeed look for the good side and not for the bad side. Mm. Yeah? But already so many people are looking for the bad side that I think it's, it's interesting to be from the other side. Well, I'm, um, I, I would like to think I'm similar. Like, for example, uh, um, there's, of course, constant agreement in amongst cool people um, that any kind of uh, trendy looking uh, architecture is immediately rubbish. Mm -hmm. um, and you sneer at it. Um, but when we see like a, a 70s building, we think it's all very cool, no? or like a Tiffany style was probably also um, totally fashionable and en vogue and, and would be victim to be sneered at. And uh, so I, I kind of uh, have uh, been not judging all the time. And I think, no, I mean, if it has like an outstanding taste and if this bar looks extremely naughty, uh, well, that may be a quality also. Mm. Well, I think there, there's an Austrian group, um, Haus Rücke, uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with it, the typical 60s. They had a beautiful slogan, uh, Amnesty for what exists. Uh, and and, and that, uh, uh, that, that kind of really was a driving, I guess, a driving slogan kind of all through, uh, through my life. And that's also why I like your work, because it's all about what exists. And, and, and therefore, I think it's kind of sometimes unfair that uh, there, there is this passion for the, the beauty of the ugly, the beauty, the, I mean, it, even a superficial um, tour of your show kind of shows an incredible wide range of tolerances and kind of new ways of looking at things, particularly the, not only the lyrical, but also the banal and also the offensive and all for all of those you've given them am amnesty by photo by taking pictures and then I, I, I think that that composition uh, I recognize that and try to apply it in architecture in, mm. in part I mean like this um, picture of the TGV interior um, in France uh, I mean it's <coughs> it's it's so like uh, um, of the moment, and it's such a projection of an idea of futurism, uh, which of course France has always been uh, prone to, and in a way I've always liked that, no? that, me, that yeah. uh, um, it is out of fashion the moment, it's out uh, already uh, yeah. in the world. Um, or I can, uh, um, there's this picture of a Jewelry's Inn hotel chain uh, uh, room interior, and uh, and in one way, of course, everything is incredibly ugly, as if like the, it was uh, looked for. Like, how can this be like the most ugly things? Uh, but together, it does create also a, a functioning unit. Yeah. You know? um, um, uh, yeah. No, no. Uh, so in the end, uh, when I wrote to uh, junk space. Uh, I read my, this was my next question. Oh, okay. okay, <laughs> Junk, okay well, we no, briefly no, ran okay, cycle okay, through yeah, them, but junk space. You, when did you come up with that term? What is it? Okay, so when I write, uh, I, 
a right because more than in architecture, you have the kind of freedom to uh, to adopt a certain tone and and to even uh, represent a different persona. Because writers can can be totally fluid in terms of who they are, and so um, after. Um, many texts that try to make the best of a uh, 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 bad situation. I wrote, before I wrote Junk Space, I wrote Generic City, where I tried to look at the mediocre uh, and typical and, and see you know, why it was emerging in such enormous quantities, but also I tried to look for good qualities in it. For instance, an absence of pressure and an absence of imposing uh, a way of behaving. Uh, if, if you live in a neutral, boring uh, situation, th there is no pressure in that sense. I try to adopt the opposite uh, perspective of a kind of Savonarola, uh, 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 like mon monk who wanted to scream about how bad and ugly the world was. So it was uh, enormous fun uh, because uh, I could inventorize you know everything that was uh, wrong uh, in uh, in a literary style that uh, gave me enormous pleasure and that of course also uh, by creating such a big accumulation implied a large argument that uh, would also answer your question about your corkscrew. Um, thank you. Um, in 2002 in an interview you said um, shopping is what the city is about and um, like it, for example also in a, in a text in the mid 90s I wrote about um, how what was perceived the 90s as this new open um, more meaningful mm -hmm. and less materialistic style mm -hmm. um, um, could is if it's not implemented more it actually turns out to be um, only a marketing ploy to push materialism and marketing um, ever further and and for example, you said all these amazing things that I found online um, in other talks um, 15 20 years ago um, and um, and you said them also in, in an urgency and in a new pressing way and um, I felt the same th I mean I'm much younger uh, later um, and um, I realized that back then one had the same sense of extreme change and danger mm. that we have today. Mm. Um, actually, also in the 80s. Mm. Like I uh, look back at some song lyrics that I wrote in 85, yeah. 86. It was like all, we are in the fast lane that leads yeah. into dark. It's like all totally apocalyptic. It felt like mm. a completely existential crisis. Mm. Uh, but this uh, sense of um, um, total materialism overkill was actually the same 2002 mm -hmm. in its intensity, if I could remember correctly. And so mm -hmm. my question is, why did we not affect change? And now we seem to be really in deep shit. And back then we criticized the dominance of the market and shopping and all went on. And one has to really ask like, what, what, what? Well, uh, yeah, yes, yeah, we, we can uh, uh, kind of see all our, um, um, all our uh, signal giving and all our, let's say, warnings or at least all our alerts is totally futile. Uh, but um, personally, kind of rather than uh, be in the kind of ap uh, apocalyptic uh, mode, I try to extract uh, in, in almost every kind of situation uh, what could still be considered as inspiring or at least how it could be uh, used uh, as a kind of point of departure for taking things in a slightly uh, different direction. Um, but uh, I would say I don't really think that uh, we are now in a worse situation. I, th I think that, let's say, with Reagan and Thatcher, there was kind of market thinking then market thinking uh, had a kind of unbelievable triumph. Uh, I think 1989 uh, would be a kind of key moment, because there it seemed that the market thinking had actually uh, legitimately uh, killed kind of socialism uh, and 
and and that it from that moment it was considered the uh, end of history, and therefore it would be there forever. Uh, but I think that uh, in the last couple of uh, maybe five years, uh, you see that uh, inequality has become a kind of really big issue. Uh, let's say beyond uh, our own set of sections, uh, it has become kind of really a big issue uh, in, in every kind of political country. Mm. Uh, then it became very clear that, that inequality led to uh, uh, enormous amount of uh, populism and we are now kind of witnessing kind of both in uh, Holland, France uh, and more or less that region uh, a kind of really radical rejection of that yeah? or so I'm not so pessimistic and, and I don't see it as a kind of constant uh, approximation of a kind of really terrible kind of end condition I see that there is a quite a responsive situation uh, of which we are maybe kind of uh, 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 participants, not initiators, but participants. Uh, and I think there's definitely a, a different condition now. What, what, what existed in, in the early 90s was a total complacency and total conviction that we were on the right way. And mm. that turned out to not be entirely the case. So now you see everywhere impulses that uh, are trying to address it. But the or, remodeling of the city um, and the total privatization of the city, that hasn't really been turned recently. No? I mean, that is still <coughs> progressing and, um, um, and um, you said in an interview also in 2002 that architects are not influential, uh, that market economy has taken over. Um, this, like, I, I don't see, even though maybe um, one can see signs of um, the high tide of populism mm -hmm. maybe having been reached, who knows, I hope that's true, I'm not so sure, um, but uh, this drive to drive out um, any kind of public pocket or uncontrolled pocket uh, and hand over every square inch of the city to commercial maybe use. maybe we see that in certain places here uh, but i see for instance in dubai an opposite uh, kind of situation that more and more places become public and really? that there is an ambition to kind of restore or, or even kind of introduce for the first time uh, an equivalent of it it's not because they've seen that it's been too dead and too private or too or do <laughs> Is it, or do they I, want I, I, th I think deadness kind of really is such a kind of matter of perspective, you know, because and I really think that Dubai is not dead and never was dead. I really have to be emphatic about that. You know, it, it offers uh, a life and it offers uh, an, a condition that uh, makes many that many people enjoy that, uh, and, and this is one of the kind of always completely ignored parts of Dubai and cities in the Middle East. Dubai has uh, on a population of three and a half million, uh, I think uh, something like 200,000 original uh, Emir Emirati. Mm -hmm. And the rest is immigrants. Uh, in Doha has two and a half million people and 300 Qatari. Uh, and I find those statistics so astonishing that we have to be really careful by calling people that. No, no, uh, no, no, but no, by hey, cities uh, that if they are I was able, talking about particular if they're squares. able. I was yeah. talking about yeah. literally particular squares or areas that you said have now become public. Yeah, I wasn't so saying there, Dubai. There's, there's for instance, I've been involved in the Middle East in, uh, for 15 years. In the beginning, it was a totally kind of American situation, black glass and air conditioning, uh, throughout the year, whatever the climate uh, was. Actually, uh, in the Middle East, uh, typically six months of the year are really wonderful. Uh, and I've seen a, a marked decline and movement away from air conditioning. Uh, I've seen uh, kind of uh, Emirati and Qatari uh, occupied public space even in summer. Uh, there is kind of, for instance, um, a, a bay in Doha uh, where uh, in, initially, you would not see a single person outside. In general, you wouldn't see a single person outside. There's now uh, a kind of 
a kind of mole around it um, that is used by the entire population, but all, including all the foreign workers and the uh, expats. So I, I think you, you really need to be alert that these tendencies are not the same everywhere and that we also, or also reinvent uh, and invent new things and new forms of publicness, I would say. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm mm. not, I didn't call Dubai dead. I just, oh, okay, okay. Uh, no, no. no I, 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 I literally, because mm. you said no. there were square uh, areas, things that have become more public, and mm. I said because they had been too dead before, that was yeah. the question. Okay. Was that okay. square yeah. too dead, or was that uh, bit, bit of beachfront too dead? Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm not no, judging, okay. and really, yeah. please mm. don't uh, uh. see me, I'm neither taking you, like, responsible uh, for the no, no, but, uh, uh, profession, but also my ideas about China and, and the Middle East is, is not uh, fixed in any good, mm. bad, this mm. is that. Uh, mm. I'm honestly totally open because no, yeah, I, I want I to ask you. Show, you shows it to you. Uh, no, no, no. Because you uh, you can tell these changes yeah. and you can tell us about these yeah. changes and I know uh, Dubai is radically uncool and people like to sneer yeah. about it and yeah. so hearing this air conditioning story I think is really interesting. But, um, but for we, instance, I, I think one of the most uh, fascinating pictures in your show is that Mercedes that is uh, uh, under kind of beige dust so completely that it seems a kind of new design. Yeah? <laughs> uh, I, I think that picture is so pregnant in terms of uh, a, a condition that y you can kind of look at it, okay, it's dirt, it's uh, uh, terrible, they don't... Uh, but you can also see it as a kind of really exceptional moment where cultures are mixed, where climates are uh, exaggerated, uh, where values are um, reversed uh, and, and where something new is emerging. Yeah? Mm. That was in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Um, you know, um, what, uh, what another sort of ongoing question that yeah. I always had for architects and mm. never quite really asked. Uh, <laughs> Um, um, the smell of buildings. Um, does uh, smell come into your consideration when building? And how do smells linger in buildings for years? And how do they gather after decades and become its character? Are there architectural smell specialists? Uh, is it talked about in schools, in education? And I'm uh, not talking here, of course, about the obvious stuff like mm. new carpeting yeah. or, or, yeah. or new wood, but you know, it's like so, like buildings have this particular smell, uh, each one has a different one. And what is that? What are the molecules in the air? Mm. Uh, um, I, 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 no, I, I think it's a very uh, important issue, uh, but I don't think I've, apart from being a kind of uh, somebody with a, uh, quite a precise nose, uh, um, I have nothing really to say, yeah. Yeah. because uh, because it implies that the architecture has uh, kind of really much more control than than it has. I'm sure that if you built uh, a house in in the Renaissance, you would uh, be very familiar with uh, certain smells of wood, and 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 certain smells of chalk. But uh, I think that you know what dominates uh, perhaps in our buildings now is the smell of m machinery and the smell of cl cleaning. Uh, and, and, and that's a domain where you really have very little influence. And, and, and where to the and this is the interesting th thing. With every completion of a building, you try to uh, kind of suggest a, a handbook. Uh, we even discuss with people how things should be cleaned, uh, how often, with what materials, uh, etc. But then over time, uh, a sort of forgetting sets in, uh, and, and, and then it's out of your hands. Yes. I noticed many smells uh, in, in this building that uh, I hadn't smelled before. And, and maybe the, the fact that there's a new building has a big effect on the smell of the old building. Mm. That's my theory. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, yeah, no, it's, um, 
I just find it fascinating. Yeah. Like, what is it in a in a two hundred years old building? Or I mean, and it, it's true. Mm -hmm. And and also, if you look at your pictures, you sometimes get a smell. Well, that's what I long, yeah. what I hope uh, for. Yeah, no? that, yeah. that that is mm -hmm. the moment of solidarity mm -hmm. between. Mm -hmm. People, I mm. hope, and they feel, mm. oh, I have smelled this before, <coughs> or I know how mm. that feels. Mm. Um, um, Self-reflection. Uh, do art architects go back uh, five, ten, or twenty years after they finished a building to see it and study how it aged? Um, and to, um, I mean, I don't want to put a bad spin on things, but no, of course, no, it's no. a little bit more interesting. To, and, no. or when, and when a composer has written a bad score, or a bad song, or a painter has painted a bad work, it doesn't matter much. Uh, but when an architect does a bad building, it stays around for decades and influences badly on actual people's lives. Mm. Uh, do architects ever feel regret? Uh, I, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 no, I'm not uh, joking, I mean... No, no, uh, of course you're not uh, joking. But that, that's also why this kind of signature architecture is such a nightmare, because it almost automatically do, do implies that you are somebody who would not have regrets, no, it, who doesn't look back, who walks over uh, kind of people who is completely indifferent to the kind of perspective of the user, or, or whether you make kind of people unhappy. I really honestly don't know a kind of single person architect in that category. So it's a kind of entirely invented category. And uh, I think that, y y of course, we look, uh, when we get an opportunity uh, at buildings uh, post-occupancy, and I even kind of did a publication with Donis, Domus, which was about uh, post-occupancy. And then you post see post-occupancy, which is what they call you know, after oh, a year, you, you have a list and you go, this has to be fixed, that has to be fixed. Is it? But um, so it's a, it's a huge, typically a huge pleasure if you kind of see people using the building, even if you see it uh, uh, according to uh, uh, rules or ways that you didn't expect or have even tried to ex exclude. So you do go, go back? I, I, I do go back, but it's the same, yeah, I do go back. Uh huh. Um. No, for for instance, uh, I did a house in Bordeaux uh, for a handicapped person, um, and uh, that person can, the, the entire house was uh, about enabling him to uh, do what he could do still, kind of rather than compensating for everything he couldn't do, and so that was a kind of really a situation that uh, required a lot of monitoring on my part and where um, therefore I went to almost you know, monthly to see how it worked, to see how he uh, interacted, how the family kind of uh, took it and even, even after his death, you know, we kind of worked on it and, and, and to, to imagine ways that it could be uh, used and kind of maintained. Um, and so, in every time you go back, you you see things that you would rather not see, uh, and you see different things that you notice for the first time. Paradoxical as that may sound, that an architect would notice something he did uh, for the first time, and uh, sometimes uh, the reverse. You sometimes um, <coughs> deliberately use cheap materials that are prone to aging. Um, and um, they sometimes um, age well? Or are you shocked sometimes by how they age and how, how do they age? The t cheap materials was uh, kind of uh, a polemic. And, and it was a polemic that, uh, on the whole, uh, budgets are too low to kind of really uh, introduce a range of um, intelligent and beautiful materials, so it, it was kind of basically, okay, if there's no money, then we don't even pretend, pretend that uh, we work with uh, uh, anything except uh, cheap material. But it was also a kind of resistance against the whole notion of luxury. Mm. Um, because from the beginning, and that is certainly kind of puritanism that uh, you and I share, um, 
and, and which uh, at this moment uh, is a kind of brief moment of uh, vindication that, <laughs> that, that the luxury, the, the dedication to luxury and the kind of uh, shamelessness with which luxury is manifesting itself and, and almost become a key uh, driver of our civilization. Uh, I, I, that was really f repugnant uh, from the beginning and, and still is. Mm. And so that that was also part of the cheap material. Mm. And then, you know, yeah, yeah, genuine it, honesty rather than the fashion. Because this is the material, this is the price, this is what it can do, and um, and and huh. it has a quality. <laughs> I, I, I find it very difficult to, to, um, to, to ever agree with, with such a kind of positive, uh, uh, such a to, uh, positive uh, qualification. It's never entirely honest. Mm. Uh, because mm. because you, you cannot be entirely honest or, or I've never seen architecture that is entirely honest. Mm -hmm. um, I guess um, we should talk about um, the European Union, um, something we've both been engaged uh, in um, intensely, me only really uh, actively for the last 18 months, uh, but uh, you um, for 16, 17 years, 2001, your EU yeah. project, um, and um, again, totally astonishing how clear you saw the problem. Um, in German, there's this uh, silly slogan, Problem erkannt, Gefahr gebannt. Um, rec problem recognized, uh, danger banned or solved, averted. Um, why did this lead to nothing? Uh, do you think they can, that you can get it together? Um, I mean, can we change the attitudes? Uh, against it or towards it? What is your personal outlook at what can happen? Um, I have to share the uh, uh, clairvoyance uh, with uh, Romana Prodi, who was uh, at some point a uh, uh, European commissioner. And so he uh, and uh, another uh, former Belgian prime minister, Guy Verhofstadt, they <coughs> defined what the issue was in Europe very cleverly. There was no representation of Europe that was compelling and that uh, was um, claiming an advocacy also for a larger cause and there was no uh, physical symbols of Europe that could uh, could seduce and and the truth is that uh, until that time uh, Europe had preferred to inhabit in Brussels a large section of buildings that, that had all been developed by developers and, and had deliberately avoided to give Europe a face. And, and that was already then into, uh, an effect of a certain fear to make Europe manifest. And that fear has always been there because the, initial, the initiation of the European project was done largely by stealth, by people who realized that kind of only by stealth could they create the co coherence and the blueprint for uh, a condition that it eventually could be developed by others. And, and in a way, the tragedy is that the project by stealth worked and that the kind of further layers have been kind of absent the moment it became uh, explicit. Uh, so they recognized it and therefore, they, and therefore they, we started to collaborate. And do you uh, think that stealth was justified or do you criticize that I think that it now? was entirely justified uh, because it's an outrageous idea. At the time it was an outrageous idea to undo a lot of the uh, friction uh, and hostility and pain uh, between kind of uh, nations that had been at war with each other. Uh, and so I think it, it actually worked wonderfully well to, for instance, uh, settle the situation between France and Germany, which is the kind of beginning of that uh, stealth. Mm. So I think it was, uh, in my eyes, totally justified. And I think we are sitting here uh, all as huge beneficiaries uh, of that stealth, even I would say. Yeah. But anyway, um, 
so the problem is recognized and um, we produced a series <coughs> of elements that kind of worked on making exactly communicating that the project was no longer a stealth project but an explicit project with an explicit agenda and an explicit plausibility yeah because nobody really knows how the eu worked we also had a kind of very didactic uh, uh, presentation of how europe actually worked all to uh, undo the kind of tension and the kind of suspicion and, and be explicit about it um, then basically different commissioners came into play uh, kind of many new countries came into play and in it became harder and harder to to actually uh, for instance uh, introduce a new uh, identity for Europe or a new flag for Europe which was uh, part of what we did and and in a way uh, the tragedy was that there is no single person who can say I'm, I'm the boss uh, uh, I, I now choose this flag and now impose it on Europe for your own benefit and uh, after 25 years you will recognize that that was right. Yeah. Uh, which, <laughs> which, uh, Do you and think they can get it together? No. Like the organization? because As, as part of that uh, kind of activity we uh, once uh, made a book because Europe is uh, kind of known to uh, be obsessed with the rules and any body which is obsessed with the rules is kind of not really kind of functional in this day of age. We decided to make a book in which we printed all the rules of Europe. And it turned out to be a book of seven meters uh, with I think something like uh, 70,000 uh, pages or something. And if you looked at that book, you kind of suddenly kind of realized oh, what a magnificent uh, achievement Europe is in spite of all our, our skepticism, because it meant that um, uh, an, an for the first time in a kind of postmodern way, uh, an entire continent had uh, shifted uh, the idea of power uh, and uh, of course traumatized by all the war and, and was based on uh, establishing agreements between different parties, different countries, first European countries, first uh, and therefore to be a part of the European Union you say that you will behave in a certain way and that way typically was kind of really positive and mm. I think in certain cases uh, with Eastern countries it has worked also kind of perfectly but it also uh, is uh, organizing and regulating kind of an enormous amount of world trade for instance you if the African countries, uh, South American countries, uh, China, they all adopt the same kind of rules so that there is yeah. a, a kind of new situation. Uh, and, and I and think the that... is the only um, trade organization, that, um, a trading bloc, that imposes uh, working rights and, and environmental rules as part of their yeah. free trade agreements. Yeah. So they can, um, an EU person told me about, for example, a specific uh, agreement with Colombia in yeah. South America. No? And, and they, the EU piggybacks all sorts of social improvements exactly. onto these yeah. things. No? So all of that, and, and that is an absurd thing that the kind of European uh, Union cannot, uh, cannot uh, communicate uh, the good things. Yeah? But uh, then maybe my most European moment uh, kind of was when I was part of a commission that had to think about Europe in 2030, and which consisted of people like Lech Valenza, Mario Monti, uh, Felipe Gonzalez, blah, blah, blah. So it was kind of 12 uh, politicians and uh, one non-politician. And um, I, 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 we, in the beginning we had to state our intentions and our hopes but also uh, our crit critique on the kind of situation and I simply said that it's, it's really totally insane that we have to think about Europe with Europeans only. Uh, it is absolutely critical that we have Africans, that we have Russians, that we have Chinese in this co committee because you cannot decide on the kind of future of uh, Europe uh, on your own. It's crazy. It's also crazy that there is only kind of people over 60, uh, etc. Uh, and 
uh, I think that is the kind of has been the problem for, of Europe for a very long time, that it seems or it's interpreted as, as a, uh, so an entity that only Europeans can shape and and define. But but clearly, because of that uh, myopia, we are being shaped and being defined by others, uh, and have been unable to uh, go beyond our own shadow. Um, and, and so that is the kind of problem. Europe is acting to it introvertly, and the only uh, extroverted uh, way that we have is kind of waging fingers and declaring uh, other countries unsavory. Uh, and, and that is our own, the only way of being uh, concerned for the world. Yeah? And so, weirdly enough, we are to, uh, our only involvement with the world is judgmental and our involvement with ourselves is too narrow. Mm. Really complicated uh, situation. Um, I found this um, really fascinating talk um, you held at the um, Architecture Association in 2002 <coughs> um, called Where is Our Soul? Mm. And um, you talked about the EU and what you described the hollow core um, the Benelux and Ruhrgebiet um, and the London area part? No. No, no but, but that, <laughs> no. Uh, that pocket of yeah. uh, um, um, aging, um, largely f former industrial area. Maybe we have a lot of things that I want mm -hmm. to go through, so maybe we just want to touch on it because yeah, I am okay. from that area in North Rhine-Westfalen, Ruhrgebiet, uh, the Ruhr area, I think, I think, I mean, and North Rhine-Westfalen has 18 or 20 million inhabitants and yeah. the Ruhrgebiet 10 easily. Ten, yeah. um, so it is the size of LA um, and it seems ridic ridiculous to uh, put them on a par, uh, but actually why not? No. Like, why so are they not a city? Yeah. Yeah. Why are they not uh, happy? <coughs> Well, they're, they're not a city uh, kind of because we are still stuck uh, with our countries, but they are acting like a city. Uh, and uh, I've recently been uh, able to uh, kind of verify that uh, the, um, the Prime Minister of Luxembourg, of Belgium, and some politicians in uh, Germany and Holland are considering how, what role that uh, entity could play in Europe. And so it, it's partly also uh, an effect that we are so uh, um, so uh, persistent in calling or in our European model of a city that we could not uh, kind of observe or could, did not notice that actually there is a much uh, bigger city being born uh, under our own under our own radar. Yes. And, and by looking at it uh, as an entity and defining the whole word hollow core, we kind of suggest that, that uh, the core can be no longer, doesn't necessarily have to be uh, solid anymore or dense, but that you can, can also be a core in a kind of much less physical, uh, much less dense uh, manner. I think one. Uh uh, fact, um, socio uh, demographic fact that uh, also um, played into this description, hollow core, is that it is extremely uh, aging and there's a population decline. Um, and, um, and I wanted to ask you if um, in planning, uh, low birth rate is always uh, taken as a given um, or is, um, is it pre-C? Uh, to even consider trying to change birth rate? Yeah. Um. I, I think that uh, the, the fact that the uh, holocore was declining uh, made uh, for the paradox that it was also welcoming immigrants. And, and for the longest time uh, it absorbed enormous amount of immigrants, uh, partly to change the <coughs> demographic uh, profile but also because only immigrants were kind of happy to do <coughs> menial work and in a way to kind of support the whole entity. Uh, and um, it's, it's really a terrible kind of moment where the connection, where immigrants became refugees, you know, because from that moment the, the whole notion became totally problematic. Uh, and until that moment it had quite worked quite, quite efficiently. Mm -hmm. And in a holocore, it really did. 
and and so it leads to you know kind of Turkish airlines that are uh, transporting enormous amount of kind of German tourists uh, kind of to the but also enormous amount of Turkish people running Italian kind of pizza restaurants etc et and creating all together into a kind of new culture there. Yes. Um. Oh, you, you asked about low birth rate. Yes. Uh, of course, also very connected to, to it. And uh, I recently, as I said, I was in uh, kind of Luxembourg and I was totally astonished that uh, the government there uh, wants to raise the population of Luxembourg from half a million to 1.2 million. Just like that. Really? Uh, yeah, and and I'm sure that nobody is uh, in in this audience expects any European entity uh, to be so optimistic, uh, but uh, yet uh, there was this kind of super European country that had a very un-European ambition to double in size. Uh, <laughs> huh? Wow! Why simply to uh, to have more material to work with? Yeah? And. <laughs> And create entity, which um, well create that kind of intermediary condition of hollow color, uh, which also is the pervasive condition in Europe. You never see the density, but if you nevertheless you know that there is density out there, uh, at least in terms of uh, number of people and, f and facilities and services. Um. I've written down, everything has to do with matter, with material. Uh, all talk of a post-industrial and hence only service-oriented economy is a fantasy because someone still has to make the goods and get, for example, the rare earths out of the soil and rock in Ecuador or China. Uh, that's a typical German comment. <laughs> <laughs> Because you make the good. Huh? Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, no, I mean. uh, but but I entirely uh, agree with you, uh, kind of without you know without denigrating the virtual because the virtual uh, will also be around forever. Um, but I recently uh, and be productive yeah, and and be productive. I think, uh, but. Uh, Crazy as it sounds, I only recently uh, was in a steel factory, and uh, that point was really brought home in a kind of most amazing way. Have you been inside a steel factory? No. Uh, I really, can I ask a question? Who has been inside a steel factory? Can you raise hands? One, two, three, four, oh. five, six, seven, eight, oh, okay. nine, ten, eleven. No, not 12? bad. Not bad. Twelve yeah. out of yeah. two hundred. <laughs> six percent. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's a kind of really um, the most fantastic experience because you feel the heat uh, and, and it kind of brings you in a kind of radical way directly to the beginning of civilization. And you still, you realize that at whatever scale, it's still going on in, in unbelievable quantities, uh, ma led and managed and, and with surprisingly few workers. Maybe if there are kind of 40 uh, workers in that entire factory, almost entirely automated, uh, but still uh, uh, the most atavistic, uh, compelling, uh, physical experience you could uh, possibly imagine. So I think it will uh, be very crucial to uh, re-insist on the quantity of making, uh, on the quality of making, uh, in, in, and to rebalance uh, our attention span uh, toward the, the issue of making. You know, um, I never thought about it this way, but in a way, um, uh, architects are like surgeons. No? We expect surgeons to never make a mistake and to all deliver everything at the same uh, quality, uh, the best quality. And I... Uh, um, for example, observed one thing whilst we were working on the South Tank uh, um, installation project in March um, um, in the neighboring building, um, that in the dressing rooms, the washing basin, um, the spout 
almost overreached, it was way too long over yeah. the small basin, and it just splashed the water all over. Um, of course, this wasn't built by you, it was by colleagues. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, but I just like, you know, I thought like, I mean, this is so clearly not working, and uh, so clearly nobody thought about this or checked this, and and um, and I for for Would years have been. A faulty spout? No, no, the spout oh, was working. Oh, okay. It just, um, yeah. it just literally they didn't somehow match, and mm -hmm. and uh, and I wonder for the years and years I wondered how does decision making work in big architecture offices on big projects like the door handles, the surface details. Who actually chooses that when you have <coughs> 20 projects on the go? Um, it's sort of the question in admiration in a no, way. No, no, um, no. How no. does it work? Uh, I think it's surprising uh, how personal it is and, and how, uh, kind of in spite of all the other kind of activities we and let's consider ourselves uh, typical for this moment. Um, we are personally kind of really engaged in in um, uh, in, in in that process and in the individual selection. I think that one thing I really learned uh, from fashion uh, and from our collaboration with Prada is that, <coughs> uh, of course, the more you have to do, the more efficient your process has to have has to be and um, <coughs> where we do kind of maybe in in one year if it's kind of very busy kind of per partner in the office maybe four buildings or four projects uh, of course uh, a fashion house now has to design kind of probably something like 1600 creations uh, and then uh, that kind of are then kind of <coughs> reduced to maybe 400 in a year. Uh, so that's unbelievably efficient. And uh, I noticed there that kind of one of the key things is a kind of shameless uh, lack of discussion uh, where you simply confronted with many choices and then you say bad, 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 almost without words. And it's not explained uh, to those who designed the proposals. It's, it's not necessarily explained in depth and, and presumably you can only do it if you're all kind of more or less on the same wavelength uh, and, until something uh, introduces something which is completely unexpected and wonderful and that you are able to recognize that too. But uh, I think that um, actually quantity and, and detail is somehow not a problem, partly because it's still one of the areas where we can kind of really be uh, individual and, and express ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that's also, it's a location of potential uh, originality. So you like to do the hand door handles, for example, you look at them. Um, yeah, I look at them. On yeah. Doors. yeah. And like, like, <laughs> no, 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 like, no, no yeah, I look you, at you them. You get into the details of at yeah, such I, level. I, I look at them and uh, yes. And, and that was also the point of, uh, kind of elements of architecture, that nothing is too lowly to be looked at and a lot of uh, interest can be derived from looking at seemingly trivial kind of parts. Yeah? Mm. And that the, looking at trivial parts and giving it them attention is also a kind of way of uh, outwitting the kind of system. Mm. Um, about design, um, like when I um, was a trustee at Tate. Okay, two questions I still have. Um, um, I was sort of, um, as a trustee, um, involved in the, the building of uh, uh, next door. And uh, it was incredibly fascinating to see um, the difficulties. The, the new one? Yeah. No? Mm -hmm. um, I was trustee until three years ago or so. And, and, yeah. um, um, and so, for example, um, um, what nobody knew when the building was um, signed off to, to yeah. or, or the architects were hired, yeah. the design was uh, was accepted, that there were 47 different window shapes and types in this building. Um, and, um, and I hear constant well-controlled indignation. <laughs> so far, about toilets, uh, spots oh, and, no. and windows. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> 
is fascination. <laughs> fascination. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, um, but I, I find often found there is like a real disconnect between digitally designed buildings yeah. and reality. Um, well, the, the great thing about our profession is that we create reality. <coughs> And so once it's there, we've created it and there cannot be a connect anymore, disconnect anymore. Yes. There can be misfit, but not disconnect. <laughs> and uh, which is, uh, I mean, uh, amazing, I find in this case, I, I, but, uh, I really let's like... Let's talk about the 47 windows. Yeah? I love the building and no, I think... No, but let's talk about the 47 win windows. Well, what more do you? What, what more can we say about it? Uh, just, um, just how um, the um, the d designing it um, with an overall shape in mind, um, with what the computer can can give you quickly as a result, as a shape. Um, then they didn't. I, I guess it didn't flag up. Alert! Alert! This has forty-seven different shape windows. Uh, this will add X hundred thousand. Uh, cost. Um. I don't think uh, that's. First of all, it's uh, not uh, not always necessary that. Uh, let's say if you look at, at the Victorian mansions, and if you start counting windows, I I think it could be easily hundred. Yeah? From this one around, kind of. So I don't think the issue is too many windows or too high a cost. Uh, I think it's whether it's contrived or not, yeah? and, and yeah. that is for me the issue. Maybe what yeah. brings me to a point, another, what I believe is digitally designed, the Frank Gehry Louis Vuitton building, um, where like the wooden beams and the joints um, look so unelegant in reality, and you can just imagine that in the plans and in the renderings, like this all seemed like really like, yeah, it's a cloud, it's super light, and, uh, but then the reality is just super uh, clunky. I, 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 I would uh, again uh, back to differ. Uh, I think that is a case where um, somebody started uh, with um, uh, um, kind of bohemian um, uh, energy and uh, vision. Uh, first attacking his own house and, and creating absurdities in it and, and putting it in a cage that was made uh, out of kind of really cheap uh, material and, and uh, not detailed rather than detailed. And it's about uh, what happens when you import that kind of mentality and that kind of talent uh, into the heart of sophistication which uh, Paris is. So it may be, you know, maybe a building that would look a lot better uh, in, uh, let's take a random, uh, a, a random location in Vladivostok. Maybe everyone would be uh, unbelievably, tragically happy with uh, a, a fantastic masterpiece and being taken seriously uh, by a, a senior architect, etc., etc. It's It's about redundancy maybe in Paris. Mm. But the, um, the, the, the observation that the, the elegance that maybe was there in, in, in the computer design didn't turn out in reality, is that something you, you think is an effect of uh, um, digital design? Or I, I cannot say it could be an effect of digital design, uh, but I don't think uh, it's a matter where somebody looked uh, at the renderings and started drooling. And then uh, when the renderings were translated in uh, reality uh, was potentially disappointing, disappointed. I think it's more to do with uh, how difficult it is uh, to do a building in a different country with different building culture, with different mentality in terms of perfectionism from another country. Uh, I mean, it, it, it is really very often underestimated, you know, kind of all the complexity of globalization, if you have good intentions, maybe if you have bad intentions, it's easy, but if you have good intentions in terms of kind of wanting to make an authentic contribution to a culture that you admire, uh, which I'm sure was the intention of uh, Frank Gehry, 
then there are so many obstacles and then I think in those obstacles it's not digital mistake that it's the digital is flattering and that architecture by accident became not as uh, sweet. It's really almost an anthropological story, I would say. I have to fit in one last um, about nightlife, um, because that was at the, very much at the heart um, of the panel uh, discussion we had here four weeks ago called Everyone for Themselves. Uh, and um, it is a, a well-known fact now um, that nightlife uncontrolled little pockets uh, um, have almost uh, disappeared from the center of London or New York. And, um, and that um, um, one can, of course, talk about protecting what is left. Um, and I found that the more capital capitalist a society, uh, the more the control of the body and nightlife um, architecture, the body, this is uh, something that, um, at least in the modern city, doesn't seem to work well together. And the question I have for you is, is uh, um, can one, could one potentially create new pockets, uh, seed, seed them, uh, where something like underground could potentially happen? I mean, it seems impossible, but maybe it is. Well, I, I think I would simply stop looking at London and New York. Uh, because I think uh, maybe what you're saying is kind of true in these uh, environments, so simply because it's kind of too expensive. And but there are um, there are so many uh, uncontrolled and uncontrollable kind of situations uh, where uh, simply in in the existing substance at least. Uh, vast repertoire of kind of unprogrammed. Uh, and, and crazy illegal um, existence uh, still continues to 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 go on. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really I would not really worry about the night. <laughs> no, not really because, and I think it, it's one of the reasons uh, that I started looking at the country, countryside or at least not at the kind of dense uh, cities. To, to and, and as soon as I started, I kind of really was astonished at uh, everything we overlooked or how normal it is currently in our uh, kind of urban preoccupations to, to ignore kind of vast territories, but, but also vast sociologies and vast uh, anthropologies. And, and I think that is one of the kind of political things that uh, the, or the, one of the oversights that is clearly having very serious political consequences and which we have to somehow overcome. You know? We have to spread our attention, I think, over a wider uh, realm. So your countryside project uh, will be for the Guggenheim, New York? Uh, I'm not supposed to say that uh, until the... No, I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> There will be a show in uh, September 2019 in a major New York museum. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there, there are many. Huh? Um, the nature of the countryside is that it is slow. There just aren't that many things about it that can be accelerated. Well, you, you'd be surprised. Yeah. Uh, because uh, one, one of the more interesting things is that uh, the effect of the digital is perhaps uh, uh, more visible and more effective in the countryside. You, 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 many things can be incredibly um, accelerated in the countryside simply uh, through uh, satellite technology and digital technology that we can now kind of receive almost anywhere uh, in the world. So. Uh, I think you can identify a number of uh, situations where time goes forward very fast and other situations where time stands still, supposedly, and, but, and where it reverses. But uh, acceleration is definitely uh, totally, not only feasible, but uh, present on an enormous scale. If, if only, for instance, uh, through global warming. I mean, it's kind of already happening, and it already takes uh, pretty drastic forms, and it already changes kind of many, many things. 
and it's much more noticeable in a country zone. Mm. Um, I guess at this point I should ask, uh, I should stop um, asking <laughs> questions. Um, and uh, Joseph, we cannot? Okay, so I guess thank you very much for <laughs> coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I'm, I'm really very grateful for uh, for this conversation and for the uh, intimate questions, uh, and probing questions you posed. Huh? <laughs> <laughs>